Great. Thank you, Anne, and thanks to uh, the center, and and thank you to everyone for for participating. But by way of background, uh, Anne alluded to this a little bit. Um, you know, I have some uh, administrative background in student affairs at uh, UC Davis and UCOP, and then in academic affairs uh, at uh, UC Riverside. Um, where I was the assistant provost uh, and worked on a number of faculty discipline cases. And then between Riverside and uh, uh, Sonoma State and, and UC Santa Cruz, and now I'm back at UC Riverside, have worked on a lot of uh, civil rights uh, investigation issues, faculty misconduct issues, ranging from uh, you know, sexual harassment, bullying, conflict of commitment, uh, research misconduct. So, that's the set of administrative experiences that I, I bring to bear on on this uh, this paper, and in recent years I've, I've uh, published, uh, separate from the work with Saul and and others related to SAT and mismatch and so on, I've uh, developed an area of scholarship working on um, sexual harassment in the academy. Uh, so I started working on this actually a couple years kind of before things really heated up in the terms of public controversy and Me Too. Um, and that was informed by kind of both my research uh, curiosity and my administrative life, including, uh, you know, working on some very difficult and sometimes uh, frustrating faculty discipline cases. So uh, this year is the 50th anniversary of the UC Faculty Code of Conduct. And nobody has ever really done a historical paper trying to look at the uh, UC Faculty Code of Conduct. Uh, my hope is that it is a kind of a, um, if you could go to the next slide, um, a unique social history and, a, you know, admittedly a revisionist history, but in ways that I, I use that term uh, in a good way, not in a pejorative way. Um, in fact, history necessarily uh, needs to be a revisionist history and a re-examination of past norms and assumptions and beliefs is, is very much a part of this project. So um, this is a, uh, a sprawling, wide-ranging research paper. Um, I think the final project product is in the it's in the final edit stages uh, right now um, and I think will be uh, posted by CSAG, CSAG fairly soon um, but you can if you have a chance to look at it uh, you know the, the the work cited section of the paper is like 10 pages long um, just because there was so much uh, to this uh, rich and interesting and, and dense area. So um, for the, the 50th anniversary um, of the Faculty Code of Conduct, my, my old, um, I wanted to, to better understand and tell the story about how uh, the Faculty Code of Conduct came to be, how it evolved, um, but also I wanted to apply, you know, kind of a C. Wright Mills uh, sociological imagination uh, to gain understanding about what all of the changes in rules and procedures, what does all of that uh, mean? What's the import of that? Um, and along the way, document where uh, this just wasn't something evolving within the University of California, but was part of uh, understanding more national trends in American higher education. And so I'll, I'll try to make those uh, connections along the way uh, where there are uh, broader sociological trends in higher ed that are animating uh, what is going on uh, within UC. Uh, and so hopefully we can get to some of those issues uh, during the Q&A uh, portion at the end. Um, so I have this quote from Eric Foner about um, history has always been regularly rewritten um, in response to new questions new information, new methodologies, new political, social, and cultural imperatives. So that, that in, in a way, captures the spirit of part of what I was trying to do in this paper. Um, because this paper is, again, sprawling and 
interdisciplinary in nature. Um, I borrowed concepts and methodological tools from several dis disciplines um, in a way that, you know, may be uh, eclectic to kind of my background and interests, but I'll, I'll try to explain this along the way. So another way of looking at this paper is it is a particular kind of, of lens within the genre of uh, sociology of the academic profession. You can think of it that way. And uh, Magali Larson's work uh, starting at, at Berkeley years ago uh, on the sociology of, of uh, academic professions is very much kind of in that, that spirit. Um, especially now, given the events in our uh, political uh, life, both nationally and internationally, um, issues around better understanding ethical norms and how much our society and institutions function by virtue of norms and not just rules. Um, uh, was very top of mind for me in, in doing this presentation. So again, there's this, this rich literature in sociology and in higher education, uh, you know, kind of rooted in uh, Durkheim and Mertonian norms, for example, uh, Braxton and colleagues uh, uh, scholarship on higher education and faculty norms. Uh, where there are contrasts between uh, the stated norm and what really happens, uh, those that uh, body of scholarship in, informed uh, this work quite a bit. Uh, next slide. Can you advance to the next slide? Is that great? Thank you. So um, some additional concepts. Again, a back one. Um, some additional concepts that I found helpful in this paper. And again, this is interdisciplinary. So I'm, I'm sort of borrowing in a flexible way from, from different uh, disciplines. Um, one is this uh, uh, concept from uh, Joan Williams, who's a law professor at, at UC Hastings, uh, looking at sexual harassment law and how things have evolved, uh, especially comparing the legal cases involving sexual harassment from say the 1990s compared to today in the post Me Too era, how our societal norms about what is and isn't reasonable behavior have changed quite dramatically. And so uh, the uh, term in, in her recent article of a norm cascade, um, I think that's, that's helpful as a descriptor for some things that are going on and that um, I will, uh, comment along the way in the, the paper. Um, another concept, and again, for those of you backgrounds, whether it's sociology or political science, if you have a, a sort of a better term that's not quite as far away as the concept I'm borrowing from evolutionary biology, uh, please let me know because I'm working kind of on my final edits for the paper this weekend. But as a descriptor of, of, of phenomena, uh, what I found very helpful, given the nature of this project and my findings, was this concept from uh, Stephen Jay Gould and Eldridge uh, about punctuated equilibrium. Um, you know, so I, I just use that as a descriptor. It's from a totally different field, but the process um, seems to apply to trends that I found looking at you know 60 plus years of faculty discipline cases and the faculty code of conduct, uh, which is to say punctuated equilibrium in evolutionary biology describes a process where there are long periods of evolutionary uh, stasis and uh, little change uh, followed by sort of brief disruptive periods of uh, massive uh, change. And that, I'll get into this more, but basically I found there's kind of, you know, over the last 50 plus years, there are three periods where you have this uh, kind of brief sudden eruption of both policy change and things kind of coming to a head in terms of collision of values and ethical norms. Um, and in between those three periods that I'll get to, you have long periods of stasis 
where the UC policies and procedures uh, change relatively little. And so again, I use that as a descriptor, it's from a different field, but it, it captures uh, some of what I found and I, I found very interesting. Um, I hadn't thought about this until doing the work, uh, uh, what's kind of going on in this paper. Um, a, a final concept from uh, organizational behavior. And again, this is to help understand the process of how policy change comes to be when it, uh, in a shared governance environment, when uh, policy changes are uh, both proposed and successful versus when they're uh, not successful, when they're not even proposed. And that's this concept of, of status quo bias, that, that there is a kind of uh, reserve uh, status quo uh, uh, momentum um, to institutional behavior. And it takes a robust combination of other factors to overcome and eclipse that, that kind of uh, status quo bias. And I'll, I'll, I'll get into that uh, more in the paper. Um, uh, next slide. Great, so um, I found it uh, very interesting uh, as part of the kind of deep history about this topic, uh, I was able to find what happened in the, the very first uh, privilege and tenure case in the University of California's history. And by way of background, um, as some of you know, and maybe some are less familiar, um, there were major uh, changes at the University of California around shared governance uh, a century ago in what's called the, the birth slightly after uh, World War II, there was a, a kind of a go governance crisis at UC Berkeley with the faculty. Um, uh, uh, President Wheeler's powers were in decline and the, the sense of institutional outrage and opposition to uh, his governance approach uh, reached a, a zenith um, at that time. And there was a, a fundamental reordering about uh, shared governance uh, with the academic Senate. And so there were a series of regents uh, standing orders and, and so on that established the separate spheres of governance uh, for the faculty through the academic Senate. And an important part of that was there was actually the creation of a new academic Senate committee called the Privilege and Tenure Committee that would adjudicate uh, disciplinary cases and uh, faculty uh, grievances. And so P and T, um, even though uh, nobody's kind of written this uh, analysis before about the history of the UC Faculty Code of Conduct, P and T is very much a germinal part of the very origin of uh, the University of California and its history um, in a way that's tightly intertwined with UC's uh, traditions of, of shared governance. So again, uh, p and was founded you know, around 1919, 1920, uh, and there was this old article in 1938 kind of describing the early evolution of p and cases at Berkeley uh, by Lauterbach uh, that I found very interesting. And so in the very first p and case, uh, I think that you know, department chair brought forward some disciplinary charges. It's a little vague on the details, uh, but it, it sounds like, you know, there was a, a faculty member who was, you know, a real jerk and a bully with other colleagues. Uh, and so um, the chancellor at the time was considering firing this, this faculty member. Um, this was before formalization of, of tenure, which, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and at the time, uh, p and decided that they didn't want to take up the case. And basically they were uh, trying to mirror the procedures that the AAUP used, but they were, I think, underappreciative of the important differences in the posture of the early office of, you know, the AAUP. So basically the American Association of University Professors, you've, you're familiar with the um, 1915 uh, statement on academic freedom. Uh, this kind of World War I era period was an important one in US higher education. 
in the uh, the rapid development of norms around uh, academic freedom for faculty. And the AAUP uh, unionization organization would get letters from hundreds of faculty across the country who thought their rights or privileges were being infringed upon. And they would sort of, by necessity, they would have to pick and choose kind of the, you know, top five or 10% and most egregious of those cases and decline to hear the others for reasons of efficiency and so on. And that was the approach that, that the sort of model that PNT uh, adopted in this first case in declining to hear a disciplinary charge and thinking, well, if the chancellor does fire this professor, then he can, you know, file a grievance after that. Um, and so a couple of years later, uh, the Berkeley PNT realized that their, their initial uh, reaction uh, was infirm in terms of the assumption. They realized that, that if that's the way that uh, Berkeley uh, PNT handled such cases, it would essentially lead to a breakdown in the system. And so the, the key difference between sort of the AAUP approach, which is one you might call elective jurisdiction versus uh, the, the responsibility vested under the regional standing orders in PNT is that a UC faculty member has as a matter of right, the ability to uh, uh, have a PNT hearing as an important protection of uh, their rights and privileges as a, fac as a faculty member. So that difference between sort of uh, mandatory jurisdiction of certain kinds of cases versus elective jurisdiction um, is a, a fundamental one. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to fast forward to the early 1950s, um, way before uh, uh, Avi had his Berkeley colleague sign the loyalty oath. There was this, this con controversy. Some of you know more about it than, than others. This is just sort of a, um, a quick summary because it, it is relevant. It sort of echoes into the future over many decades and is a, a searing part uh, of the faculty's collective experience uh, at the University of California. So at the peak of the McCarthyism uh, Red Scare era in the early 1950s, the UC regents uh, voted to require a loyalty oath. This was before there was the sort of California Levering Act uh, similar oath, which is the precursor of the, the one that Avi and all of us have had to sign and so on. Um, but the regents uh, voted to require uh, faculty and employees to sign this loyalty oath that they were not members of the Communist Party. Um, this was very divisive and controversial at the time. And adding to that difficulty, uh, you know, the, the Privilege and Tenure Committee was uh, tasked with the unenviable job of individually adjudicating these cases for you know, dozens and dozens of professors who refused to sign the loyalty oath. So originally there were about 81 professors who refused to sign and uh, PNT recommended against termination in 75 of those cases. The number of cases kept whittling down as people got pressured to sign or some people you know, left to go to other jobs and universities. And in the end, the regents rejected all the faculty PNT recommendations went forward with termination of all of the remaining 31 faculty, uh, took a year or two for this to churn uh, through the, the uh, state courts in California, and it was eventually overturned, but only on procedural grounds. So if, if you read that decision, Tolman v. Underhill, it's very unsatisfying if, if you're trying to look for uh, substantive content, for example, on uh, principles of, of academic freedom. Um, it is an important case in other respects uh, regarding UC's institutional autonomy and what are the boundary conditions of that autonomy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, legislation from the state. But the, the impact of that loyalty oath, the, the division and acrimony and distrust between uh, governance stakeholders and specifically the regents versus the faculty uh, did have a lasting impact on uh, UC faculty. Uh, next slide. So um, looking at, 
at kind of getting a level set on uh, practices in the 1950s. Um, some other important developments in the late 1950s, uh, President Kerr advanced a proposal soon after taking um, the office of uh, being UC president that that essentially codified a continuous tenure. You know, there had been sort of uh, default practices around uh, tenure, or you might call it quasi tenure in the decades uh, leading up to that. There's an important AAUP statement on tenure and academic freedom, the, the 1940 statement. So this was a period of uh, kind of taking a step back to US higher education. This was a period of rapid expansion of colleges and universities, especially public uh, universities and colleges uh, in the US in the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, and so there was the number of faculty uh, was rising quickly. Um, and with that, there was an evolution and a maturation of uh, professionalization norms. One of those was around uh, uh, getting approval for continuous tenure. And uh, an amusing side note on that is that uh, he didn't know it at the time, but you know, nine or 10 years later, uh, President Kerr was a beneficiary of uh, continuous tenure. This, this ended up being very surprising to him because he didn't, uh, it didn't occur to him. But when uh, Governor Reagan and the regents uh, fired uh, Clark Kerr, they also wanted to fire him from his underlying academic appointment. And uh, Governor Reagan was very frustrated that he could not do so because of this uh, codification of continuous tenure at the university. So um, I, thought, I thought that's sort of an, a telling example about the importance of, of tenure vis-a-vis -vis academic freedom. Um, so the centennial record of uh, UC um, Statman's uh, volume has a description of how P&T uh, committees worked, especially at Berkeley in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, the committee would meet very uh, seldom, but when it did, he described it as you know having very difficult uh, duties. This this process of it being a, a judicial committee essentially or quasi-judicial uh, hearing committee is essentially the same today, even though the elaboration of the rules is, is a lot more specific. So the, the forerunner uh, Senate bylaw in effect at that time uh, was Senate bylaw 140. Uh, there is a lot of language from that bylaw from the um, 1950s that continues today in uh, the Academic Senate Bylaws uh, 335 and especially 336. Uh, one key difference uh, then and now is at that time, if you wanted to fire a professor in you know, the early 1960s, you only had to provide, the administration had to provide substantial evidence, which is sort of the, the fourth uh, and lowest uh, standard of evidence below even preponderance of evidence. So, and I'll touch on standard of evidence a little bit later, but that, that was remarkably different than uh, today or 20 years ago, 30 years ago, et cetera. Uh, next slide. So um, I mentioned uh, understanding the, the social context and looking at ethical norms. So I thought it's important to give some documentation to how different those norms were kind of back in, in uh, earlier eras uh, in the 1950s and 60s, and especially um, norms around anti-discrimination and anti-harassment principles were just remarkably different. So um, one of the interesting kind of side notes that I came across in collecting materials for this um, paper was this unusual case where uh, the provost at UC Santa Barbara, and at that, at that time, Santa Barbara was more like a liberal arts college, and the provost was the highest ranking official for the campus, like, like the chancellor. Um, the, the provost, at, newly hired uh, provost at UC Santa Barbara um, was on a recruiting trip in New York, faculty recruiting trip, and apparently tried to pick up somebody at a bar and that was an undercover police officer who then arrested him. And this was not 
that uncommon for things like that to happen in the 1950s. There's a number of scholars who've talked about um, the sort of uh, lavender scare uh, that paralleled the red scare and how uh, a number of uh, state governments, uh, state governments, et cetera, had a, a policy of essentially trying to purge gay and lesbian employees and faculty uh, from uh, public sector uh, jobs. So it, it was an illustrative example um, of how things are different. Um, another concept that I found very helpful in this regard is um, Miranda Fricker's concept of epistemic injustice. And that, that just, she's a, a philosopher that describes how um, social structures and norms can make it very difficult. And sexual harassment is one example of this, but not the only one. Um, uh, social structures and norms can make it difficult for victims of sexual harassment to even have access to the conceptual tools that one needs to know and understand the social experience of, of what it means to be sexually harassed. So I, I thought an important thing to keep in mind as I was doing the sprawling uh, research paper that spans many decades um, is to simply document how different attitudes were in the day vis-a-vis uh, -vis sexual harassment. I think I mentioned this a little bit a year ago when, when I was starting this project. So the um, Jenkson uh, is the Reitzman book uh, on the academic revolution. This was a leading higher education book about the transformation in US higher ed in the late 1960s. And it's full of these highly uh, sexist problematic um, passages that uh, that describe essentially um, male undergraduate students kind of manipulating older white male faculty uh, and is completely ob oblivious as to the scope of the harm that, that I'll, I'll get into uh, later. Again, that's I use that simply as an illustrative example. It's hardly an outlier in, in that respect. That, that was the atmosphere, the, the air that uh, people breathed at the time um, within higher education. Uh, next slide. So why was there a faculty code of conduct? The faculty code of conduct was eventually approved in 1971. And a key uh, analytical question is why was that? What prompted the faculty code of conduct? Um, and so really it was during this heightened era of, of acrimony between the university and the public, between uh, UC's internal community with the faculty versus external stakeholders and leadership, you know, with uh, the governor and, and the public. Um, when the university was very much in a position of being embattled, I have this very interesting quote here from President Hitch when he was speaking frankly with the academic senate about how uh, tough it was for the university at that time. Um, during this period of uh, escalating uh, anti-Vietnam protests, basically there was this trend of what was called reconstitution of courses. And that's where some faculty, maybe the numbers were exaggerated on how many, um, instead of teaching the assigned class that was you know, in the course catalog, they would kind of uh, deviate off to uh, hosting discussions about American foreign policy and, and other matters that, that were not uh, strongly anchored to the underlying curriculum of the, the assigned courses that they had. So um, this trend at several UC campuses and nationally um, was really what kind of sparked the, the public upset and reaction that then led to uh, a number of universities, not just UC, but a number of colleges and universities across the US to adopt faculty codes of conduct during this era. Next slide. So uh, these are just kind of two contrasting views. I'm not gonna comment on who's right or wrong. There's sort of elements of, of both there, uh, but uh, Clark Kerr had a very negative view about uh, the faculty's uh, 
sense of professional self-regulation and accountability. Uh, Robert O'Neill, who uh, was a Berkeley law professor uh, in the 1960s and later the president at the um, University of Wisconsin and the University of Virginia and a leading uh, academic freedom scholar had an excellent uh, article in the early 70s kind of looking at, at the rise of UC's faculty code of conduct and responding to the, the Carnegie Commission that was then chaired by uh, uh, former UC uh, President Kerr um, and had a very different take on uh, the on a faculty's uh, posture around uh, a professional responsibility. Uh, next slide. So this just kind of gives you a sense of the uh, policy scene at the time. Okay, so um, by uh, 1971, uh, President Hitch adopted an interim faculty code of conduct that was then uh, supplanted by a, a formally approved version that you know, went through a rigorous shared governance process uh, with the academic senate. And this is simply, this quote is, is his explanation in the interim policy about um, the basis for, for what was happening with the faculty code of conduct. There's been no comprehensive policy concerning faculty conduct and the administration of discipline. And this has led in some quarters to the erroneous belief that specific standards do not exist. So this was sort of the seed corn for uh, growing a, a new uh, faculty code of conduct. Uh, next slide. So um, what other things that were going on in the background uh, politically and socially at the time, there was an important case that I think most of you have probably heard about uh, Angela Davis, who was a, um, a radical activist faculty member at the time, an acting assistant professor at UCLA. Uh, she was still uh, finishing up her uh, PhD. Again, this, this period of the uh, 1960s and into the early 70s was a period of, of rapid expansion of higher ed, uh, especially at the University of California. So there was a lot more faculty hiring. There was the baby boom uh, student enrollment growth that was going on. And so it was not uncommon to hire uh, faculty who were you know, ABD at that time. Um, so uh, Angela Davis, the, the UC Regents, because she was uh, a declared communist, um, uh, voted to not reappoint her. Normally a non-reappointment, which is not the same as a firing, it's not a disciplinary decision, but it is quasi-disciplinary. Um, that was the controversial case that sort of conjured up the memories of the loyalty oath 20 years earlier and was in another area where the UC Regents adopted uh, action that was opposed by the chancellor and the campus faculty at UCLA. Um, so this was actually an important case in the history of the University of California because it's the single time that the AAUP has formally uh, censured a UC campus in the entire history of, of UC. So uh, the way that worked, even though it was the regents taking the action and UCLA decision makers uh, opposing it, it was a censure against uh, UCLA that the AAUP took. And that, that swirl of controversy and distrust and concerns about academic freedom informed the faculty's posture in this shared governance uh, process around uh, melding sections on faculty rights in the same document that, that codified faculty responsibilities. So I have another quote here from uh, uh, Bob O'Neill's excellent uh, article from that, that time. So a formal faculty code of conduct was approved in 1971. There was sort of a second round, you know, rinse and repeat. They made some further modifications, not, not terribly uh, significant changes, but some changes in a second version that was formally approved by the Senate and the Regents in 1974. Uh, next slide. 
So uh, this is extremely difficult to document. So um, it's one of the interesting things about doing both kind of practitioner work and scholarly work uh, in this era. Um, this timeline shows all of the uh, individual cases where a tenured faculty member, um, because again, if somebody's fired for misconduct and they're an assistant professor, under UC policy, that doesn't have to go to the Board of Regents. It's, it's a chancellor final decision, typically. But if a tenured faculty member, associate or full professor, um, is formally fired, these 10 cases represent the uh, extent of those. So I have the initial of the campus around each of those uh, cases. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that formal termination cases are, you know, the, the far end of the distribution, the far end of the tail. Uh, so for every formal termination case, there's a, a great many more cases that were probably mostly similar to those cases, but the professor sort of resigned a long way uh, or, you know, uh, read some informal resolution or went to another institution, et cetera, and sort of took actions him or herself to avoid formal uh, termination. So a couple things you see here, there is this long gap um, between, uh, there was a early termination uh, case, uh, faculty firing in, uh, of a UC Davis professor in around 1968. There wasn't another formal uh, termination until uh, a couple Berkeley cases in the uh, 1990s when uh, uh, Chancellor, during the Chancellor Tian era. One of those cases was a sexual harassment case. The two Irvine cases around 2000 involved a, uh, a fertility clinic scandal uh, in the UC, Health, UC Irvine Health Sciences era area and those cases involved basically massive uh, misconduct where uh, embryos were switched. There was all kinds of financial fraud. The uh, couple of the faculty fled to South America or Mexico to evade uh, criminal prosecution. These cases, uh, I'll get to the Irvine scandal later because it, it uh, has, um, uh, it, led to other changes in, in UC policy and, and UCI policy particular. There are a couple of uh, Riverside cases in the 2010s that I happen to work on. I'll try to not comment on that too much for that reason. And then you can see, uh, you know, years ago, you could go many years without a, a formal termination case. And now kind of in the post Me Too era, you know, every six to 12 months, it's likely there will be a uh, faculty termination case that goes to the Board of Regents. There were a couple uh, at UC Santa Cruz and one at UC San Diego. At least, I think two of those were probably sexual harassment cases. Um, a couple of these cases along the way, one at Berkeley and, and one at, at Santa Cruz. And again, I'm, I'm using public available information here, not sort of attorney client privilege or confidential information. But a couple of those cases, Berkeley and San Diego, involved different forms of, of teaching misconduct where you know, a professor, for one reason or another, uh, refuses to teach their classes. OK, so that's a big picture timeline. Very hard to kind of document all of this. You, you won't find this uh, slide anywhere else. Um, next slide. So this just shows kind of the evolution in Senate bylaws. I'm not going to elaborate too much on it. Sometimes the bylaws are just um, changes in renumbering, but other times there are more substantive changes. And so the change in 2001 is the most significant on that chart. And I'll uh, get to that in, in a few minutes. Next slide. So um, the 1970s, you see on the earlier timeline, was a quiet period in terms of termination, but it was a significant era in terms of other changes that would gather that would gradually um, gather steam. And so uh, after Title IX was passed in in uh, 1972, here are some of the early 
uh, changes. Um, starting with Cornell and Yale and uh, in the mid 70s, you started to see popularization of the, the very concept of sexual harassment. Um, the first lawsuit over uh, faculty student sexual harassment, the Alexander v. Yale case, um, Catherine McKinnon's book kind of animated the legal theory for that case and, and several others. Um, the first OCR complaint, Office for Civil Rights, which is now in the Department of, of Education, then was part of what was called Hugh. The very first OCR complaint in the US involving sexual harassment was filed by Women Organized Against Sexual Harassment a student group at UC Berkeley. Um, eventually that did lead to some major changes in terms of the appointment of a uh, Title IX officer for the campus. And it, it was one of several things that gave rise to the first UC policy on uh, sexual harassment prevention. Um, as Greg mentioned in the, uh, in the introduction, uh, he did an important early survey of uh, women students, I think senior undergraduates at, at Berkeley uh, in the late 70s, uh, published in 1982 with uh, Donna Benson. And that was one of the first surveys that, that captured the scope of, of faculty on, on student, um, essentially male on female uh, sexual harassment in that era. Um, and then I have a quote from, uh, Helene uh, Moglin, who was UC's first female dean, as far as I could uh, document, commenting on UC Santa Cruz at, in the 1970s. And I think the end of the quote, uh, you can't quite see, but she's uh, describing how the scope of sexual harassment on that campus at that time was basically just unbelievable. Uh, next slide. Um, there was this episode in the 1980s. Um, I think I'll skip this because I'm, I don't want to uh, run late on time. I, I've talked about this in the presentation a year ago, where there was this process where uh, the faculty tried to revise the faculty code to better protect students from harassment and romantic relationships, and it was voted down. So. Uh, the next slide and then uh, skip to uh, slide 17. Keep going. There we go. Um, so the next, again, uh, this concept of punctuated equilibrium uh, was very helpful in my paper. So the first wave of rapid disruptive change was that period in say 1969 to 71 that, that led to the creation of the Faculty Code of Conduct. Then there was this long period of stasis, essentially. And the next period of substantial and disruptive change was in the late 90s and, and early 2000s. So I have a quote here from UC's general counsel, uh, Jim Holst, describing at the, in the mid 90s and what would give rise to uh, the Simmons uh, Report Task Force, just how extensive the problems were in terms of uh, uh, p and handling of faculty discipline cases. Um, these cases were unnecessarily burdensome, too frequently involved unreasonable delay, and there was a compromise in the effectiveness of the, of the system. And in a lot of these cases, sort of uh, campus p and panels would kind of find a, a gimmicky way, if you will, that's sort of my unkind way of putting it, um, a gimmicky way of, of uh, finding a lack of jurisdiction or closing out a case without really getting to the merits of the case. Most of these cases were uh, sexual harassment cases that, that I'm talking about that led to this uh, uh, change in UC policy. So there was a major reform kind of in two waves, slightly not connected or directly connected with each other. Uh, the first wave, uh, Dan Simmons, former uh, Senate chair, uh, there was the, a task force that, that he chaired in the late 90s and came up with a bunch of recommendations. Uh, and then there was a second wave that was intramural within the Academic Senate. And that was uh, actually George Blumenthal was chair of 
uh, the UCPNT committee that went about drafting some major uh, changes. Uh, it adopted many, not all, but many of the Simmons task force uh, recommendations and also addressed a host of issues that were not addressed in the Simmons report. Uh, next slide. So you see, this is the unbundling of what was in bylaw 335 um, and separating this out into separate bylaws for jurisdiction. Uh, the key thing here is the separation of grievance cases, which have a very different posture to them from disciplinary cases, which is the central focus of my paper um, in bylaw 336. Uh, next slide. So these were the changes that were adopted at that time. Uh, clear and convincing evidence is the standard. Um, in my book, uh, the change to sanctions may have been uh, among the most important things. So previously there are only, only three or four sanctions allowed. And um, an interesting case that, that arose that I found out about in getting edits back on my paper is there was a case in the 90s where a faculty member who had a regental termination action scheduled for the next day sort of retired that night before their regents termination item. And so that case and some other cases underscored the point that UC did not have a sound mechanism for uh, sanctioning uh, emeriti faculty. So uh, there, a new sanction of uh, curtailment or denial of emeritus status was added. Um, there was a narrowing of uh, when it was appropriate to use the sanction of demotion. If we have time to get into that, there's an interesting Riverside case that, that led to that and a lot of internal debate between the administration and the Senate at the UC wide level. Uh, and so the three year rule was added. So if the administration has known about a case for more than three years, uh, that's a, essentially a statute of limitations on bringing a disciplinary charge. The last item there is in uh, 2000, uh, 2001 to 2003, there was a revision to the faculty code of conduct, kind of doing the work that wasn't done earlier in the 1980s that more expressly prohibited, prohibited uh, faculty student relationships and had added important language on the power differentials between uh, faculty and their students. Uh, next slide. Next slide, there we go. So again, the third era of, in this punctuated equilibrium um, framework that I, I've used is, starts around 2016. So there were some developments, kind of things happening on the national scene. Um, there's a Supreme Court case, Garcetti v. Caballos, which is about uh, speech rights of employees. And in cases after that, um, there were encroachments on faculty rights rights to criticize the administration. And so since the, the sort of legal protections around academic freedom were sinking, there was a compensatory codification of that right in UC policy, including in provisions of the faculty code of conduct. Um, during this, the Obama era, there was a greater expansion of enforcement around uh, sexual harassment, the Dear Colleague letter of 2011. Um, and there was, there was in the Napolitano era, say starting in 2014, there was increasing momentum around uh, policy issues amending first student procedures uh, with uh, sexual harassment. So there was the, the Cheryl Vaca task force uh, in 2014. Uh, next slide. So the, um, there was a faculty oriented uh, task force looking at uh, disciplinary procedures. It was focused on faculty uh, sexual harassment issues, not all disciplinary misconduct, uh, but this, these were the key recommendations that came out of that uh, task force. Um, I won't get into all of these, but there were some significant uh, 
recommendations, I, I, I would characterize it as a mixed bag. In some ways, it's kind of a frustrating and underwhelming report. And uh, let's skip to the next slide. So this is in 2016, again, shortly before uh, kind of Me Too took effect in the middle of the Nepal Napolitano uh, presidency. Um, as these things go, uh, President Napolitano's written response to the Joint Committee report from Vaca and Hare was, was rather harsh. Um, so she was very dissatisfied with the report's lack of engagement or substantive recommendations in, in all of these areas. Um, not having a single investigation, but sort of having multiple serial investigations, you know, from the Title IX office and then a charges committee and then PT, et cetera, uh, is, is a big issue. The time frame for investigation um, is another one. Uh, there are issues around the three year rule. Uh, also, during this period, uh, there was an OCR investigation of UC Berkeley finding violations, including around faculty student sexual harassment, including uh, how cases were delayed, sometimes, uh, you know, took several hundred days to reach an outcome. And then the big one, and it, this comes after kind of years of internal turmoil with the state auditor's office and California lawmakers, is there was a very hard hitting California state auditor report um, looking at uh, sexual harassment faculty student cases at several UC campuses. And again, highlighting this issue that these cases would take several hundred days to completion. And so that report, uh, given the political posture behind it at the time, uh, prompted the regents to basically uh, cajole the Senate to make some major revisions to Senate bylaw 336. So um, the last piece there kind of catching up to where we are as of today in 2021 is last spring because of a growing tension between state and federal law and UC policy under bylaw 336 the senate has now adopted preponderance of evidence as the standard of evidence in uh, sexual harassment and sexual violence cases so for other kinds of cases uh, research misconduct, bullying, et cetera, it still uses clear and convincing. But to stay consistent with uh, the sort of combination of federal and state law, uh, it uses the preponderance standard in SVSH cases. Uh, next slide. So the bulk of my paper is kind of at the UC level and the faculty code of conduct, but each campus, does ha each campus has local procedures for operationalizing uh, faculty discipline. And this too is, an, uh, is a rich era, area of history where it's important and interesting to understand how uh, different institutional histories and memories, collective memories on campuses lead to different outcomes. Um, and so this is just kind of big picture. Uh, a key issue is uh, who has responsibility for pre-hearing investigations. Uh, it's typically a administrative function on uh, seven of the campuses, including Berkeley, even if they have faculty advising or as part of the uh, committee doing that work, it's, a, it's vested as the administrative function. Um, then uh, UC Riverside is sort of in an in-between position where they have a Senate vested charges committee, but it's just making a analysis and uh, recommendation on whether or not probable cause has been met. It's not an investigative committee in, in the true sense of the term. Uh, then the sort of high watermark for uh, Senate purview is uh, UCLA and UC Santa Barbara, which have either a Senate charges committee or a Senate charges officer uh, who is formally vested in their local procedures with investigative duties kind of leading up to uh, disciplinary cases. Um, uh, next slide. So these are just two examples. I um, uh, won't go through all this text, but there's the fertility clinic scandal at Irvine that I mentioned earlier. Um, 
that led to several cases that took four or five years to go through this uh, churn. There were sort of multiple back and forth investigations with P&T, and it led to a major reordering reord of the Irvine uh, kind of pre-hearing investigative rules and, and Senate bylaws. Um, and then the other issue on this front about uh, pre-hearing local procedures uh, that's significant is former uh, California Supreme Court Justice Carlos Moreno uh, was tasked with doing a review of UCLA and in 2013 came out with this highly critical report documenting essentially a, a, a backlog of cases and a lack of due process fairness for complainants involving racial discrimination. And that those could be cases of other faculty complaining, faculty complaining against other faculty for race discrimination or student faculty uh, complaints, et cetera. Uh, next slide. Uh, research misconduct is its own kind of esoteric era area. I just wanted to kind of document on the campus level what goes on in these cases. There's a there's an elaborate sort of braiding of local and UC policy with federal uh, regulatory oversight. There's uh, a lot of federal regulations, especially in cases that involved uh, federal federal research funding. Can't get into all those details, but we can come back to that in the Q and A if we have time. Um, next slide. So uh, my overall conclusions from this paper, uh, one interesting thing is that to an extent that you can't quite grasp just from reviewing lots of policy documents and drafts and so on, is that the last few years came closer than anything else in the last century to creating a system where essentially the, the P&T disciplinary hearing process was almost supplanted by some other kind of more if more efficient fast tracked administrative process the um, the sort of policy pressure on fronts related to sexual harassment and etc was uh, strong on that and almost kind of fundamentally altered the system that again goes back to the uh, early origins of the region standing order and the very nature of why UCs have uh, p and communities. Um, the other uh, thing that, that I found interesting is even though as a researcher, you know, I've, I've done other related articles studying hundreds of faculty sexual harassment uh, cases, for example, I came away from this kind of uh, broad effort at documenting uh, in a systematic way what has happened at, at UC over the last six decades or so. I came away with that disagreeing even more uh, with Clark Kerr's pessimism about sort of declining uh, faculty uh, conduct standards and values. And the, the, the quote at the bottom, the last line is kind of cut off so you can't see it, but it's from uh, Robert O'Neill's earlier sort of insightful 1974 article on the rise of UC faculty's code of conduct. And this article from almost 50 years ago, I, I think has uh, forward looking uh, implications that, that carry on today, that the value of a faculty code of conduct, uh, the process of, of doing that work of revising, or in that case, creating a faculty code of conduct is itself a kind of important Durkheimian moment that uh, is the process by which the university academic community uh, sort of concretizes its commitment to different ethical norms and principles. And that that process of engagement and reaching uh, shared ground um, is the very long-term value of a faculty code of conduct. I, I, I see a version of those ideas being car carried out uh, at UC, uh, especially over the last five years. Again, under this punctuated equilibrium theory, um, it's one of the three periods over the last half century where there has been a process of, of rapid change and evolution. So those are my big picture conclusions from this uh, sprawling mammoth 
uh, research project on the history of, of UC's faculty code of conduct. There are a lot of parallels to um, uh, related trends at other public universities and, and private universities in, in the US over this uh, span of time. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Great, thank you so much, Bill. Really interesting talk. Um, the floor is open to questions right now. Uh, and we can see all of you. Oh, uh, George, you had a hand raised? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, thanks, Bill. That was a very interesting and comprehensive talk. And thank you. I think it's great that you're able to put this really long history into some kind of context. So I think that that's really good. I have, I have a comment and a question. Uh, my comment is just bemoaning the fact that um, recent changes to the code have, have made it much less uh, uh, pure in the sense of having different standards of proof for different violations of the code seems to me inelegant and not really recognizing uh, that there are fundamental rights at stake here. So, um, you know, we can argue about what the right standard should be, but um, I re actually think this is a case where one size fits all. It's like saying in a criminal court, well, if you're accused of murder, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. But if you're accused of uh, armed robbery, the preponderance of the evidence will do. I mean, to me, that makes no sense. But anyway, that's my opinion. And I'm simply expressing it as a comment. Um, uh, my question really concerns the, uh, um, the, the difference between grievances and disciplinary hearings. One of the reasons we separated out grievances from discipline and made it into 335, 336, and 337 was because uh, there was so much uh, misunderstanding and cross, kind of cross misunderstanding of, of what those different actions are. And um, I used to always hear about grievances being lodged against someone. Actually, a grievance is really a statement that somebody's rights and privileges have been violated. It isn't against someone, although there may have been a perpetrator, but it's, it's really a statement of the university in some means has, has violated my, my rights. Do, do you want to comment on how broadly you think it's understood what the difference is between uh, uh, grievance and, and, and discipline. I mean, you understand it, but obviously many people do. But in terms of the broad faculty at large, is it your sense that that really is understood? Um, you know, uh, it probably is not. And there, there are some intuitive, understandable reasons why that might be so. You know, so for an average faculty member, um, they don't necessarily think in great detail about these matters unless they're involved in a case, you know, either as a complainant or a respondent or a third party or sort of some conversation within their department that involves a grievance or a disciplinary complaint. Um, the sort of elaborate procedures and details about what that means um, uh, is not something, at least in my sense, is that an average faculty member, especially uh, a less experienced faculty member might not immediately think of given that context. Um, what I would say, George, uh, is about the distinction and the fundamental difference between grievances and disciplinary cases, um, maybe share a couple of points uh, with the group. Um, one is that, you know, I did do a fair number of uh, interviews to kind of flesh out uh, the background facts for different uh, aspects of these policies. And one of the people I, I interviewed who was the former uh, Senate attorney who advised uh, P&T in the Senate um, during the era, you know who I'm talking about, um, uh, during the era 20 years ago when these changes were made, separating out bylaw, especially bylaw 335 for grievances from bylaw 336 for discipline complaints, she thought that kind of reordering of the architecture of the UC policies and those separating out those two bylaws was of equal importance to all the changes to the faculty code of conduct that were made. Um, 
I think a fair argument, I mean, it's sort of a debatable point or an issue question of, of um, degree, but I take the import of her observation that that was uh, a fundamental uh, change that, that was made um, uh, by, by your uh, PNT committee kind of in the late 90s leading up to 2001. Um, the other point is kind of as a historical antecedent to that, um, these cases at UC Irvine, and this kind of came up in my interviews, um, were a good example of how blurry boundaries about what is and isn't a grievance versus a discipline complaint um, uh, really caused a lot of uh, delay and lack of uh, justice, essentially, uh, for parties. And was one of the reasons that the Irvine cases kind of churned through multiple investigations for four plus years in the late 1990s. So it was a important issue um, to get rectified. Um, nowadays for faculty who find themselves engaged on these issues on most campuses, you know, whether it's UCSF or Riverside or Berkeley, most academic Senate or AP offices have a fairly good elaboration of the difference between um, a grievance and a disciplinary complaint, but the two issues do kind of still sort of naturally get uh, blurred. Um, and then maybe I'll comment on your earlier comment just a little bit about the standard of evidence. Um, it, I did interview the past Senate chair who uh, was involved in the adoption of the, the new standard of evidence um, uh, last spring. Um, my overall sense is I, I, I do agree with you that there is this inequity issue. It was there before, but now it's there in a different way in having one standard of evidence for um, uh, sexual harassment cases. And now if, you know, if, if, if another faculty member is accused of racial harassment, then that's, that's, that's the uh, avenue where that the rubber meets the road on that question is right now there's, you know, a pending President Drake task force looking at race discrimination and harassment uh, related policies. And we have this painful inequity and disparity in, in policies. Um, and again, clear and convincing uh, applies to all other kinds of uh, faculty misconduct too. So I, I agree with you that the, the uh, disparity is uncomfortable in terms of uh, uh, sort of an elegant policy commitment that's harmonized in a way that's consistent with our fundamental values. Um, I did uh, write a whole article in the Journal of College and University Law a year ago looking at, as an empirical question, uh, what standard of evidence cumulatively has the least amount of error? And I make an argument in that paper, and I think it's hard to make the contrary argument that um, the preponderance of evidence standard is the best error reduction standard, all things considered. Um, so the, the uh, clear and convincing evidence standard sort of gives a higher weight to protection of faculty rights, but that weight comes at some uh, cost. So different people can, take different views on that. But th those were uh, my sort of peer reviewed views on, on that question. Other questions? Other questions here? Well, I have a question. Um, because the faculty code of conduct seems to be observed by those who are not faculty more in the breach. And students don't really seem to have a clear idea that there is such a thing. So I'm curious, and I know this is not exactly a Senate activity, but it has to do with um, the way in which the university presents itself to its population because in fact, this regulates the entire population within the university, since students are dependent upon how faculty conduct themselves. So I wondered in terms of your 
organizational theory, if you have thought about how the code of conduct or its perception filters out into the larger university community. Uh, yeah, actually, that's a very interesting uh, question, Anne. Um, could, uh, let's see, Gemma, could you go back to my slides? The first backup slide I have is one on ethical norms, modeling and reinforcing norms. If you could show that. I think it's responsive to uh, Anne's question. Um, and I have this passage from a, a book chapter by uh, Braxton, Proper, and Brayer. So this is slide 28, if you could go to that. Um, but basically, let me just read the quote. Um, if norm violations receive sanctions, students respect these norms. Uh, the, these norms, student respect for these norms may actually increase. In other cases, a lack of negative sanctions may make a student cynical about the profession while failing to change an underlying belief that the behavior is wrong. If current norms are not transmitted to the next generation of scholars, they are unlikely to model them. So the context of that uh, book chapter was a, a piece by Braxton et al. looking at faculty on graduate student uh, misconduct and the importance of, of teaching graduate students and postdocs, et cetera, the next generation of scholars about giving them uh, both proper teaching on the internalization of norms and showing them uh, demonstrating to them uh, that the university takes uh, the accountability for misconduct seriously so that they will then have confidence in the integrity of the system. Um, at a big picture level, that is kind of the most fundamental, important socio-political uh, ethical process that's uh, at issue in this, um, in this area. Uh, the internalization of norms and accountability, uh, confidence, uh, not just sexual harassment, but all, all of the ethical norms about proper uh, uh, research ethics and uh, mm -hmm. principles of respect for others. Uh, that process of internalization of norms, um, creating an environment where undergraduates graduate students, lecturers, staff, et cetera, feel like they can make a report when they see uh, misbehavior and not, not uh, greatly fear retaliation for having made that report. That is a um, crucial organizational attribute. Uh, so when all of these things, maybe let me end on a, an anecdote that I think kind of pulls all that together. Um, so, um, you know, I've been involved in as an administrator on some uh, difficult faculty uh, misconduct cases. Um, one case involving if a professor who uh, sexually harassed uh, multiple um, uh, graduate students. Uh, the professor was was fired by the Board of Regents. And, you know, like six, 12 months after that case, I was overseeing uh, the Title IX office uh, at UCR and went into a meeting to meet with an undergraduate who had a complaint against her uh, graduate student TA. And so I opened the door to meet with her and the, the care advocate and her support person um, was one of the complainants in that um, faculty uh, sexual harassment uh, case from a year earlier. And that graduate student was then, um, at that time, was the instructor uh, who saw that uh, the undergraduate she was working with had some problem and uh, could tell something was wrong and had a conversation with that student and figured out that some other uh, graduate student was uh, harassing, sexually harassing this undergraduate or freshman. Um, and that that graduate student who had a very difficult experience was now um, teaching this undergraduate about um, making a Title IX report and taking her to the Title IX office so that there could be uh, 
a proper accountability uh, for that issue. So in a way that um, is part of my lived experience, but that mirrors what Braxton et al. are describing in that slide, it really brought home to me how um, the lived experience of creating better ethical norms is a is a unfolding and difficult, but also um, important and at times beautiful process. And so um, I think that that speaks to kind of the underlying issues about the, the broader community that you're you're asking about, Anne. It does. But that was a lucky freshman to have that yeah. practice. Yes. Well, we have come to the end of our time. And I want to thank you very much for your talk. I myself am absolutely fascinated. And I'm sorry, actually, we don't have a bit more time to go into some of the issues, but your paper is about to come out in our rope series. And then we shall all hopefully get back to you with more ideas about it. So thank you very much. So uh, thank, thank you to George and Anne and everybody uh, for being my partner in this uh, research project. It's been an interesting journey. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Okay, bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Be well, everyone. Have a good Friday. Can, we, can I try something with you? Sure. Would you try talking to this gray thing, this owl? Okay. Bye -bye. Wow, that's so much better. Oh, I was turned away from it? Yes. Yeah. So it's like you're talking to them, but look at how you look. Yeah. Look at this frame versus when you look oh, at the course, owl. Oh, because that's my frame. Of right. <laughs> owl. Yeah, so it's mm -hmm. better if you look at that. Oh, gosh. Well, I hope I uh, pressed. No, no, no.